Last time I checked, I was still a kid. Childish, childish. This all freaks me out a bit. Childish, oh shit. How can I pet when I'm still a kid? Childish, oh shit. Who the hell decided I was ready for this? Hey, I'm Greg Fitzsimmons, remotely from uh, Venice Beach, California. I'm Allison Rosen, remotely from Burbank, California. How's it going? But to, well, I feel like we're in Westwood. You know, I feel like we've met in the middle. <laughs> How are you doing, right. Greg? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. You know, I feel like my life, and I think I've said this before, it does, it has not changed that much. I mean, I'm sitting in my office, which I do. The only thing different is I'm not getting on the road and going places. But as far as being home, when I'm home, I'm home. I'm with mm-hmm. my family all the time because I'm when I'm away on the road, I miss them. And so it's not like I'm like, all right, honey, I'm gonna go to the I'm gonna go to the track today. <laughs> I never go to the track. You right. know, and I, I feel bad because I feel like as an American man, there's a certain amount of time I should spend in my life in a members only jacket with a cigar, mm-hmm. uh, you know, holding tickets and, and and celebrating once in a while. Right. Cheering. As Cheering! If out of the blue. Talking to a stranger about who's handicapped and I got an inside tip on this guy. And like how much spitting are you doing? You got to do a lot of spitting. Yeah, you spit a lot, and then you uh, you shuffle back and forth. Mm, yeah, and and then you walk down to the track to see if one of the kid, one of the do- uh, dogs, one of the horses is is kicking mud. Oh, what does that mean? It means that they're they're dragging their feet. They're not oh, they're not ready for the race. I see. And they really do do it. They they kick the dirt a little bit. You got you got to watch out for that. <laughs> like if you have money on one that's kicking mud, you should move your money. Move your money. <laughs> Uh, but then I, f- I feel kind of bad about going to the track because it really is pretty heinous what they do to uh, what they do to the animals and how Wait, many of them die. Do you actually go to the track? Is this a thing you've to. actually done? I've oh, never yeah, been to. to. I've never played the ponies. Oh, it's so much fun. Really? Yeah, it's so much fun because there's there's fun ways to bet. There's there's trifectas and perfectas, and it's all these different ways of betting on. You can bet on three horses to come in first, second, and third. That's a perfecta. If you nail that, it's like hitting lotto. But then there's trifecta, which just means you pick three horses to come in in any order. And then so there's all kinds of ways of mixing it up besides just picking one horse to win. Um, and uh, you know, and then you have a bunch of people all like chipping their money on 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 a bet together. So you're all cheering together. Is that like when a whole office goes in on like a lot of lottery together or does like an o- Oscar office pool? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't get my uh, PPP from the government, though. I didn't. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't get my twelve hundred dollars. No, I didn't get I didn't qualify for that. I didn't get my you know small business loan. That's forgivable thing because Citibank fucking sucks that's who i have and yes they do all the banks it just suck kept right crashing now, all the pages just kept crashing and uh so i never even got a chance and now the money's all gone and now i'm reading about how the money has all gone to like Big huge companies. corporations yeah. it's yeah. fucking bullshit i know i know um so not only am i losing money my tax dollars are going to walmart and all these other companies maybe not walmart but like a bunch of like huge chain restaurants like the cheesecake factory right and it's like bullshit i think they're gonna do another round probably of money but yeah it's, it's all bullshit um but wait on a happier note i feel like finally this past week i have been able to slow down and be present with my kids Oh, very in a nice. way that Good I hadn't you. before. Both Daniel and I have experienced this and it's weird. It just sort of suddenly shifted where I can be, I'll sit on the floor with Owen, my one-year-old, and he has these little stacking cups that he's obsessed with and he'll just hand one to me <clears throat> and then I'll take it and I'll pretend to drink out of it and I'll hand it back to him and then he'll hand it to me again and then I'll put it on my head and I'll pretend to sneeze and it'll fall off and he's delighted. And then he'll take it and then he'll hand it back to me. And it is as boring as it sounds. And yet I'm able to be like, <clears throat> there's nowhere I need to be. And so I'm just going to play this game with him at his level because he's enjoying it. And then I can enjoy it because he's enjoying it. And before I had trouble with that. I'd be yes. like, this is, I need something a little more fast paced. 
No, this is like a Buddhist meditation. Yeah. This whole pandemic is like, I find myself feeling the same way. Like there's nowhere else I have to be, so be here. It's And it's like, usually, now, you know, if I'm home and I'm not on the road that week, then I'll usually go out and do sets like three nights a week. And on those nights, I'm just not as present at mm -hmm. dinner because I'm kind of thinking about going out. And, and now I'm never going out. So like dinners have been like an hour long, hour and a half long. We sit around and talk. We laugh. I'm um, starting to play some practical jokes on each other, which is fun. <laughs> and so uh, I, I think it really is something I hope I can maintain when we go back to normal life because every everybody always says being in the moment is the key to happiness. Same. I do think I will look, I mean, assuming it all ends and everything goes, goes back to normal, which I got, I hope it does. Um, I will look back on this time as like, there was something very special about it. Um, I've heard people say that when things quote unquote go back to normal, they're going to have trouble, you know, they're not going to feel comfortable being around people and like they don't know if they'll ever go to a concert again, et cetera. I feel like I'm going to like overnight go back to how I was and I'm not going to have trouble and this whole thing will become book. It'll be bookended as this weird, surreal uh abnormal like experience yeah. yeah yeah it feels like a dream living it so i imagine it's going to really feel like a dream when you think back about it you know right. and you think about like you know how people came together during world war ii like my my mother would tell me about when she was a little kid they would like gather metal to make ammunition out of and like oh, wow. the whole neighborhood would like they'd get chewing gum wrappers and i think they were much thicker back then they would peel the paper off the metal on chewing gum wrappers back when they used to have metal on the mm -hmm. outside and they would roll it up into balls and they would bring it to the local uh coffee the local uh, deli and they would they would hand them in everybody wow. would just hand in metal and like you know there was just so many ways that uh you knew other people were doing worse and so you felt for them and i think that selfishly makes you feel better when mm -hmm. you're caring about other people. Right. Right. So what are you doing now that's uh, that's on the same order as rolling up gum wrappers? Well, last night, me and the kids went to Smart and Final, and we bought a, an entire grocery cart full of cans, pasta, pasta sauce, granola bars. And this morning, I dropped it off at a great charity that you should support, that's called uh, People People Concern. Uh, it's it it's the number one homeless outreach program in Los Angeles. That's nice. So how so do you do like a contactless drop off? How does that work? Because I was thinking of wanting to do something similar, and then thinking, well, how do I get the products to people without coming in contact? Well, that's what's good about them is like some of these groups are like you know make bag lunches, and then. Other people go and hand them out, but that's just mm -hmm. a, that's a lot of germs between a lot of people. Right. This way, you just you put it in paper bags, and you drop it off at the at the center. They give you three locations around Los Angeles, and you drop them off at certain hours, and then they do all the sorting. And uh, some of it goes to people on the street, and some of it goes to they they have a lot of shelters as well where they they serve people. They serve three meals a day to like thousands of people every that's day. That's great. It's incredible. Yeah. And so uh, sometimes we go there and we, we actually bring the food and then we prepare it in the kitchen there and then you actually serve it to them. So I'll go with the kids and do that. But you have not been doing that during this though, right? No. no. Right. Yeah. Um, so we have a pretty exciting show for everyone. We have Leanne Kreischer. Oh my God, I can't wait. I bet she's going to be amazing. She's going to be amazing. Uh, I love her. She hosts Wife of the Party, um, which is, it's about parenting. It's about life. It's, you will learn something listening to it. And she's married to one of our favorite people, Burt Kreischer. And I'm curious about how all that works. Yeah. And, you know, I've listened to her podcast and she really is like a very strong person. She's from the South, but she's one of those strong Southern women, which is one of my favorite genres of human beings. <laughs> Strong, <laughs> one of your favorite archetypes. <laughs> yeah, strong Southern women I'm, uh, I really like. Because yeah. they've got that sweetness, so they can almost get away with more. <laughs> right. But they've got a steely reserve. Um, yeah. and, uh, and they have two daughters. They have two teenage daughters. So we will get into all of that. Um, 
we take your calls on this show and we have a new number for you to call new as of a a few weeks ago, Uh, 805-317-4243. So call that number, leave us a message, ask us your question. We will answer it. Also, humongous news. Uh, We are now putting up the video of these shows so you can see our beautiful faces. YouTube.com slash Allison Rosen. See how bald Greg is. See how um how you, you look good on camera by the way thank you i don't you. know if you're doing special makeup or whatever i but am you, i'm doing yeah, special makeup good. i've got cat makeup on do you like my whiskers yeah yeah and good. my cat ears uh yes i have been putting on on some makeup because you know gotta put my best face forward so youtube.com sure. slash allison rosen go watch them comment let us know what you think um keep those itunes or apple podcast reviews coming it helps out the show so much uh, apple.co slash childish is a quick way to get there. Just also didn't find us in wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at childish pod. Email us childish pod at gmail.com. Greg, should we just, should we just get into it with Leanne right now? Yeah, let's do it. Why, why, why what? screw around here? Right. Actually, what? you know what I want to do? I do okay. want to get to, we had a really good Instagram okay. question last we week. We post a question on social media every week. And this past re- week, we posted a good one. I mean, they're all good, but especially good. You wrote. Question on Instagram this past week was, if you've ever shoplifted, what did you take? And, uh. We got uh, just great answers. DME90210 said, a balloon. I got spanked, but the balloon was super worth it. I got to keep it. Banderson says, a grape. Got yelled at by my parents saying that shoplifting. I I don't know if that is. Hmm. Um, Jared Baum said, First day of second grade, walked to A.J. Bayless grocery store and filled my Incredible Hulk lunchbox full of whistle pops. Got caught. Manager gave me a note to give to my parents. And when I left, I buried the note in the alley on the way back to school. Lorely. Perfect crime. I'm oh, sorry. Well, I, I stepped on that. What was the last thing you said? A perfect crime. <laughs> Lorely. Similar, but different take. When I was a kid, I tried to steal a Hanson CD from Walmart. I got it all the way into the bathroom and couldn't open the plastic fast enough, so I just put it in the trash can. I still feel horrible about it to this day. Let it go, Uh, Laura Lee. It's okay. This this one I love. This is from Zombie Mum. Patio chairs from a border bookstore outdoor seating. That is the best because... It wasn't because you wanted them. It was for the it was for the joy of the crime. <laughs> you were you were in your your friend's mom's minivan with the sliding door on the side, and three of you jumped out with hoodies on, and you did it. And the people sitting outside laughed, and you laughed, and one old lady was pissed and yelled, and and, and then you probably threw the chairs out. Yeah. I just never would have thought of like lifting a patio. And I don't mean lifting literally. I mean, taking a pet. It's me trying to use cool stealing. Yeah, slang. Very... Pinching a patio chair, taking a five finger discount to a patio chair. Breezy pie says makeup often tried a bathing suit once and got arrested. Next night was prom. Parents let me go and I was too drunk to go in. Fortunately, a responsible mother of two now. Um, I know someone in high school who got arrested stealing a bathing suit as well. Apparently bathing suits hard to steal. You guys. Look, and we don't condone this, by the way. I do. I don't. It depends on who you're stealing from. I condone stealing from the man, like Walmart. Steal. Just don't steal from the, the mom and pa shop. Yeah. I'm not going to go on record as saying I condone stealing from the man. What about this? What about okay. this type of stealing? Jesse Poo 1300 said, I was in my early 20s. I had a case of water on the bottom of my grocery cart. Checker didn't see it. And I didn't say anything. My friend calls that the, if they don't see it, it's free shelf. (laughs) Now that's a tough one because they're not really doing their job. Right. They're supposed to look down there. And you could, in some part of your mind, say, I kind of forgot, but you know you didn't forget. Right. It's one of those crimes by omission. How do you feel about that? I feel fine. 
as yeah. much as I'm trying to take the moral high ground, I feel fine with that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. 50 ass LM stole certs. Remember certs? Do they still make certs? Of course. Yeah, certs. Certs with, don't they have retin? They have retin, which they never explained to us what it was. No. Uh, stole certs from a pharmacy when I was under 10. I still feel guilty about it. They were cinnamon flavor. It may be why I hate the taste of cinnamon to this day. I'm 32. How about this badass? Brad Brad Bar Brad Barian. I used to exclusively steal bullets, knives, and flashlights. Oh my god. And I would also poach chickens. I guess I was a prepper as a youth before the term was coined. Don't know the term to this point. Prepper? Yeah. You don't know the term prepper? No, what's a prepper? Oh, like a doomsday prepper? It's like someone oh, who's... Oh, okay. It seemed more far-fetched until this pandemic where it is like uh, what's happening with civilization and can we get toilet paper? But yeah, prepper is someone who's like ready for when the shit goes down. Right, right. I, which again, excuses it a little bit more yeah. because my whole thing is if the shit really goes down, like say there was a nuclear strike, my move... I go to uh, Marina Del Rey where all the boats are, lo- are are kept. I get on a boat and I steal it and I go out to Catalina Island where the, um, you know, the wind is always blowing towards the shore. So mm-hmm. the island is safe. You're not going to get any radiation out there. Is it wrong to steal that boat? Yeah. Yeah, it Why? is. Because what if someone else wanted to take their boat to Catalina Island? You should There's just, a lot of boats. If you're a prepper, you would have a boat at the ready. Um, I don't know. I think of a prepper as somebody who hot wires as well. I can I can get on board with that. Yeah. Listen, this is fun. Thank you yeah. guys so much for all of your awesome uh, admissions of guilt. We appreciated it. Thank you for your honesty. Yes. And uh, I say we honestly get into our interview with uh, Leanne. Let's do it. All right. Hello, Leanne. Hello, Hello. Bert. Hey. 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 Hello. Hey, let me see your hair, Greg. Oh, I like it. It feels so goddamn good. It's so freeing. Can we get to the base of this? Leanne said that when we watched you get your hair shaved on. I'm sorry to take over your podcast, guys. That's okay. Uh, Leanne. Leanne Let's said, think of ourselves. We, so we watched you get your hair shaved on Instagram, and Leanne froze and she goes, Oh my God, he's getting emotional. Like, he's getting, this is a big deal. I want to know what it was like when you shaved your head. Were you scared? Were you nervous? Did you get emotional? It was very emotional because I feel like, you know, for my, I started balding early. And so the little that I had left, I was really like attached to. And yeah. Rogan used to ride me. He's like, dude, just shave it. <laughs> and so it was really hard. And then I, I needed my daughter to do it because, like, you know, I'm really close to her. And I just felt like she would get a kick out of it, too. And Aww. she did it. And I swear to you, I feel so, like, unconcerned with my looks now. I used to think about it. Now I don't. That's awesome. Oh, I've been wanting to shave mine so bad. And I, mine's just stringy and long. And it's not full, yeah. and it looks worse. You almost look sick when it's this long and thin. I like it. I think it's sexy. What about the facial hair? When's the last time you were down to your face? <laughs> oh, well, no, Tom shaved his face. No, didn't Tom yeah, shave Yeah, Segura shaved yeah. my beard when we did the weight loss challenge like four years ago, and I got out of the car with a shaved beard, and Isla, the first thing she said is, you look like a pervert. <laughs> And I said, how do you know what a pervert, I go, how do you know what a pervert looks like? She goes, I'm staring at one. (laughs) That was pretty bad. That was pretty bad. He looks better with facial hair for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing because when you shave your face, you see the guy you were when you started. It's it's almost like going in a time machine. You look at your face and you go, I remember that guy. That (laughs) boy was so scared to meet girls. He was terrified. Oh, he used to not get laid. I know this guy. Yeah, right, right. Oh, he didn't feel confident. It's It's like like when I shaved my penis for the first time as an adult (laughs) and I was like, I'm a little boy again. 
time. <laughs> and then when I jerked off, I felt like a pedophile. <laughs> you do. It is a weird pedophile feel when you shave everything. <laughs> and what I was going to say is it's like you're a facial hair hoarder. Because, like, you know, with hoarders, if you sort of, like, peel back the layers of mess, you get to, like, there was some trauma there that it was when this all started. It's like you can find the moment that you started covering it all up. Oh, yeah, yeah, but the facial hair is the last one. First, it's sweatshirt, then it's double XL shirt, then it's hats, then it's facial hair. Right. (laughs) Well, let me ask you this, Bert, because, like, you know, never mind owning your face, but, like, for a guy, and, you know, you know this, you don't don't have a uh, a, a slim figure, and, and you walk around the house in a Speedo, you take your shirt off on stage, like, was there a point where you didn't feel good about your body and then suddenly you just like kind of owned it or were you always comfortable no i never knew i was fat to be honest with you like it wasn't until segura started fat shaming me that i was like i remember saying to leanne i was like am i overweight she was like yeah of course she was but you look great and i was like yeah i thought so right because tom was 270 and he was fat shaming me i was 230 and i was like i'm in great shape compared to him and, well, if, uh, you were, if you're a gay guy, like gay guys love bears and you're a classic bear. Leanne, do you, do you like, are you attracted to bears in your life or was he the first? Uh, he was the first. But you know, I was, we were watching when I first met him, he weighed 185 pounds. Ooh. He was very lean. Dick felt, oh. dick, my dick uh, belonged <laughs> on my body. It looked like it meant, was meant for my body. <laughs> but he's, you know, broad shoulder, big biceps. And I always dated really lean guys, really thin, lean, uh, Boys. string being looking guys. But, you know, I w- we were watching Platoon the other day, and I was like, oh, my God. Like, my first crush was Tom Berenger. That oh. was my first big crush. And when I first met Bert, he looked at, like Tom Berenger. I didn't really put two together. That. Yeah. And then, you know, <laughs> then he filled out over the years. But I'm still very attracted to him. I like, I mean, I like big guys. Leanne's, by the way, lost 16 pounds. 17? No shit. 17 pounds. Really? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. How'd you do Where? it? I got a trainer. Oh, nice. How are you training with them during lockdown? Um, on Zoom. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. It's Zoom's great. pretty fucking amazing. It is. It's it amazing. Is. I don't it's think great. I'll ever take a meeting in Santa Monica again. <laughs> right? <laughs> it really is showing how much you can get done without having to go places in person. It's yeah. true. Yeah, speaking of which, I have a meeting with TBS right now. Oh, oh you do? Yeah, I'm going to hop off. Is there anything else, Allison, we wanted nope. to cover before I left? Uh, just uh, how are you handling quarantine? Uh, I'm actually doing surprisingly well. I was saying before this started, or maybe I already said it, but I haven't drank in five weeks. And it's not, it's just been, uh, I mean, l- last night I wanted to drink, so I had to shoot something and I was stressed out. And I was like, if I've ever wanted to drink, it's tonight. Today, I kind of wish I could smoke pot because it's 420 and I just want to be connected to some sort of community. But um, but yeah, it's been kind of nice. I get up, I work out, I do like two podcasts a day and then make dinner, watch a movie with the girls. The girls have been not fighting at all. They've been close. It's really crazy. I, it makes you really appreciate marrying the right person. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> fuck Aww. a quarantine. You're like, God, I can't imagine any of the bimbos I had been with before. <laughs> Right. Naked doing their makeup in front of a mirror. Ugh. <laughs> so you got you guys are being your best selves for each other during quarantine. You're losing weight, you're not drinking. Right? Right? Yeah. We're not uh, dead. I was a cunt yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Ah, we all have our moments. I, right. I've oh, not been we need to hear day. about what kind of cunt you were after you go, Bert. Okay. All right. I love you guys. <laughs> See you. You look amazing, guys. I'll talk to you later. Stay safe. All right. You too. Thanks, babe. So have a good ha- meeting. <laughs> So is being around sober Bert different than when he's drinking? Uh, yes and no. You know, when he, the, the, I guess, great thing about Bert when he drinks is he doesn't really change. You know, some people are rageaholics when they get drunk or, you know, they become passive aggressive. He's pretty much the same guy unless, unless he gets upset. Like if, if I've done something inadvertently to hurt his feelings, he's far more injured when he's inebriated. Like how, way worse. <laughs> how do you respond to that? Because I have a husband who I love very much who can be like one of the things I love about him is that he is sensitive. However, there are certain times where I don't think he'd appreciate me saying this, but I don't think he listens anyway. Um, <laughs> Where he'll he'll be hurt or upset by something, and my reaction, I'll want to be like, oh, come 
on like not this uh-huh. again but i don't want to shut him i don't want to hurt him so i don't do that but do you have that reaction like if you're dealing uh-huh. with okay yeah are you kidding <laughs> have you met bird at all <laughs> uh, there's so much um temperance i have to temper everything because my trainer actually said this to me recently because i was um talking about an argument we had had recently where i i was like i don't get it i don't even remember the argument but Mm -hmm. i was like don't understand this level of upset i don't understand why (laughs) you don't (laughs) knowing me for 18 years now you don't give me the benefit of the doubt that i wasn't trying to be some evil terrible person Mm. we have a benefit of the doubt thing too often yeah 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 where i go well shouldn't i get the benefit of the doubt that i wasn't trying to be uh, you know a bitch i was trying to do something else but that doesn't seem to happen Mm -hmm. so he said to me the trainer said some people in life are passengers and some people are vessels (laughs) Uh, you are a vessel and so the good part about that is you tend to be wiser deeper um life is more rewarding in a lot of ways but the bad part of that is you have to carry some people along sometimes Mm. and they just don't have the ability to be a vessel maybe they can come in and be a vessel for a few minutes and then leave but usually one person is the vessel and the Mm -hmm. other one is the passenger and i think in our marriage I'm the vessel. <laughs> not that he's not. He's a great partner. Clearly, we've been together 18 years, so it works. But when when he gets up, I never get upset with him. I mean, hardly ever. I mm-hmm. just am such a, I, I am a benefit of the doubt giver. Where I go, he would never do that on purpose. So then I'll throw it out. You know, mm-hmm. it doesn't nice. mean anything. So would, if, you, would you consider being a vessel being codependent? That's a good question. Maybe. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I think he's more codependent on me than I am on him because Mm -hmm. I am by myself most of the time and actually am good with that. (laughs) I'm good with the coming and going of Bert because, you know, he's like a tidal wave. He comes in the house and it's just whoosh. Everything goes everywhere. I mean, you see his nightstand. It's a disaster. (laughs) Yeah. And I can't get it to stay not a disaster. So there's part of it where you go, you know, when he goes, then the house cannot be just blown apart by by Bert, and I can regulate a little better. But um, but I don't know. I guess maybe he is very he very much. I say this all the time. If he could like unzip me right here and just climb inside and stay there all day, every single day when he's home, I think he'd be really happy. What yeah. is it that you? What and and for the listeners at home, you just showed like if you could unzip your chest, like if he could yeah, climb yeah. into your bosom, kind of, and be in your yeah. heart. If I what, could put him in a baby Bjorn, he'd be super happy. <laughs> what is it that you are providing him? Do you think stability? I think I'm super um, transparent. I don't mm-hmm. ever have any kind of hidden agenda. I'm not somebody who says, "Yeah, that looks great," and really means you look like fucking shit. I don't. <laughs> I'm not that person. So I think. He knows that, and that must be really secure because he's in a different city every night with a different bunch of people, lots of fans, and um, and Hollywood can be really disconcerting and and hard to live in, I think, sometimes for a lot of people. Greg and I have had nothing but stellar award-winning careers, but for some people, <laughs> it can be a town filled with rejection. Yeah, it can be really well, hard. Well, I think it's what, what I think maybe has created such a solid foundation for you guys is that, you know, Bert earned it. Like he spent a lot of years struggling on the road, not making a ton of money. And, you know, being this guy that was putting so much out into it and not necessarily like what Hollywood was looking for. So he found his own way and now has super success. And part of that is your support of him through that time. And it also means that now that he's got it, he's not going to take you for granted or you you guys have figured out, you know, what it's like in tough times. So now you can kind of celebrate the good times. I think that's true. And I think, you know, when we first got together, we had no money, uh, no money. Um, so our date nights would be like playing Scrabble. Yeah. <laughs> so we kept, we had so much fun playing Scrabble that we kept saying, if we can just always have fun playing Scrabble, we'll be good. Yeah. Everything else will sort itself out. You right. know? 
Right. Um, every marriage has money issues. Every marriage has sex issues. Every marriage has, you know, you don't do as much as I do issues. That's that's pretty normal. I think marriages ebb and flow like that. But if we can sit down and like play a good game of Scrabble, then it just kind of writes our boat. Yeah. So, yeah, so, starting at the beginning was good. <laughs> Leanne, you're an only child, right? Yeah. Did you always want to be a mother? No. So, mm-hmm. so can you talk about your like journey to becoming the mother of two girls? Yes. Um, f- I never really thought I'd get married. My mom, I don't know if you know much about my background, but my no. mom um, is not diagnosed, but I've been in therapy for long enough to diagnose her for my own opinion. And I believe that she has a borderline personality disorder. She's oh, just that's divorced really her. tough. It's really hard to be raised by that, especially mm. I think, especially as an only child, because I didn't have another person to go. Was that was that a little crazy, <laughs> or was that right. just yeah. me? You know, it was just me. But well, know, just I describe mean, describe borderline a, a little bit to people because it's it's very specific and it's it's the most therapists will not treat people with borderline personality because they're too manipulative. Well, they don't believe there's anything wrong with them. Right. So most of them don't seek treatment or ever get diagnosed. So I've just started reading books. I've started in therapy and none of my, I have had two therapists, one when I lived in New York and one in LA, and none of them said, hey, I think your mom has ABC. Mm -hmm. They kind of said, here's a few books to check out. Let me know what you think. Right. And I read this one book called Trapped in the Mirror, and I went, oh, my God, was someone hiding in a closet and just <laughs> taking notes from my entire childhood? It really blew my mind. Cause, and I went, well, this is what my mom has. It is narcissism as, as, as a personality disorder, which is a little specific. So I guess for that specific personality disorder, uh, any viewpoint of the world, any opinion that goes against that person's opinion is life-threatening. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was my understanding of it. So if I said, you know, I don't like Lando Lakes butter. I'd rather have like parquet. Oh, my God. You know, there were periods of time when I was 13 and 23 and 33 where I was totally dead to her. Like completely excommunicated from her whole family and never want to see you again for years. What what had you supposedly, quote unquote, done? Uh, When I was 13... Um, I was able to choose who I wanted to live with and I chose to move back with my dad because I was living with someone who had borderline personality disorder. Right. And I was like, I think I want to move back to my dad. And so she didn't talk to me for about three years. Oh, my word. And then the second time, I was 23, we got in an argument because um, she asked me to lie to her current husband, her fourth husband, about something. Fourth that husband? She was, Yes, yeah, she just divorced her sixth. Damn. So, and I think she's no. engaged to number seven. <laughs> so, so I didn't think what I would a, what ever a hopeless get married. Romantic, <laughs> right? <laughs> she Holy keeps thinking shit. this one's gonna work. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. I mean, I haven't talked to her in a yeah. long time. But, um, but yeah, the second time I just said, "I'm not lying. I'm not going to lie. I'm sorry. I'm not doing that." And that one, uh, then you're dead to me. Uh, never want to mm-hmm. see you again. That time she turned her whole family against me. No, I because I had gone against the Bible, uh, and oh. and you know it did not honor my mother and my father like <laughs> in the commandments. So I didn't get to come back into that family for a long time. So being raised that way, I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm ever gonna get married. I really don't know how it works, like effectively, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't see the benefit. It's always gonna end. And, you know, I didn't learn how to fight growing up. I didn't have a sibling, and I couldn't argue with my mom. And I never argued with my dad because he was my safe place, so I I couldn't threaten getting, you know, on his bad side. So I just didn't learn how to argue. That was one of the first things I figured out when I got serious with Bird as I was like, wow, I really don't know how to have an argument because I believe if you have a disagreement, then the the other person's going to leave. They just leave. Yeah, right. Um, so, so I was like, it's just not for me. I'm just not going to get married. And then I met Bert and I was like, okay, okay. I think this is the first time I've met somebody that like I could just play Scrabble with for days on end. He, I'm never bored. As my dad had always said, you're going to have to marry somebody where you're never bored because right. I'm just, I just got really bored really fast dating mm-hmm. guys. So clearly Bert is not, <laughs> not boring. boring. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you didn't get into therapy until later. And that's kind of interesting because, like, I've watched your podcasts and 
the way you interact with your daughters is uh, it's very um, you really take them in. You really like you seem like kind of an A type. You're a very efficient mother. It seems yeah. like, <laughs> yes. and you, and it seems like you really like uh, meet them in the middle. Like you're not domineering, and yet you also seem like you're very much in control. Like where well, did you learn that without therapy? I couldn't have learned it without therapy. Oh, so you um, did. You got all that from a therapist. Uh, well, I think actually, I got it partly from therapy, and I got it partly from. I remember being a child watching my mom and going, "I'm, I'm not gonna do that." Like, that's not okay. And I did have some really great female examples. My dad had a girlfriend for a long time in my childhood that was amazing and was a good, you know, um, step-parent-ish, you know, figure. And I had a great aunt. I stayed with my aunt a lot who was a great parent. So I did have some examples. I just, you know, my direct example was not great. So I think at a certain point I went, well, what would I would have liked? I would have liked to have been seen because again, when you have a narcissistic parent, you have to fit their mold. So you can't, you can't be seen. Like you can't be seen as who you are. Right. You, you right. can only be seen as inside their box. And I thought that I didn't like that. I really, it really was bad for me. So I thought, well, I'm not going to do that to my kids because I need to see who they are and see what they need to be an effective human being, to be someone who's happy and balanced, who wants to give to the world and wants to receive from the world. And so if that's my goal, then I can't impose my own things on them. I can give them some wisdom and hope that they take it, but but I have to see who they are. And our kids are so very different. I mean, we could not have created two more different children. Um, yeah, I saw one podcast. And you said uh, Isla is more of like works well with a group, doesn't yes. really do her own thing. Yes. And then Georgia, I guess, is a little bit more like uh, more individual. She's she's a bit of a hybrid. She can go either way. Uh-huh. Um, they're just really, really different. They they process information differently and emotions completely differently. Um, they deal with expectations totally differently. Um like, for instance, Georgia always from small child, um, like uh, actions and consequences made total sense to her. It made no sense to Isla at all. Like if you climb on the couch and jump on the floor, you're probably going to hurt yourself when you're 18 months old. Isla had yeah. no connection to this cause and effect right. at all. Um, Georgia was very verbal. She could tell you what was wrong. This is what's wrong, and this is what I need. Isla was not. Isla was very physical. It, she would be upset, and she would hit you. And now you go like, okay, we have to learn not to hit. But really what's under that is I don't have the words for what I feel. Right. So Because I grew up a hitter also, So and no one gave me words either. Who so, did you hit? The other kids at school? I, I don't remember being hit, hit her as young, but like actually in my young adult, I was a, was a Really? <laughs> yes. Yeah. We're going to need to hear about this. You got into <laughs> yes. fist fights with other girls? Yes. And with guys because I, I didn't have words. I didn't grow up, again, knowing how to argue. Damn. I didn't know how to argue. So I would just have these overwhelming feelings and I would break something, throw something, hit something, hit somebody. You You seem like such a calm, stable, centered person. (laughs) It is amazing to me to hear that you have a little bit of Greg Fitzsimmons in you. Because Greg has a past of that. (laughs) I see it in her. I see it in her eyes. I connect to it. There's there's a strength. There's a strength underneath. And there's like a, you know, when you're from the South, you don't fuck around. You know, (laughs) that's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, So, yeah, at a certain age, I decided um, this was not working for me and I needed and I, and I also had some kind of inner wisdom to know that I didn't have all the answers and I needed to find someone who could help me find them or could give them to me. And is that so, when you got into therapy? Yes. When I was 23, I, I was in therapy for about four years. And then I moved here and um, just didn't get back into it actually till I met Bert. And when I met Bert, I went, I do not know how to do this. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. So I better get some help. So um, you... 
so you met Bert and you were able, he, he, he continued to keep you entertained and not bored and you could play Scrabble with him. Yes. Um, and you started to realize maybe you do want to get married. Is that what happened? Yes, I think, yes. We, we were both, we both kind of just went, huh. I think this may be, you know what's interesting about mental health? Uh, not to get too mental healthy on you. But I think you marry what you need to fix, mm-hmm. right? I married someone who's very self-focused. But he's not narcissistic, right? So, so people might think he's really narcissistic. He's actually not. He's just really self-focused. And I needed to fix some of that for me in, in marrying someone I could go, hey, hold on, you need, to, you need to take a look over here for five seconds. And he always goes, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I was really wrapped up in my own shit. Sorry, babe. And so right, whereas, kind of whereas your that. mom would have shut you out for doing that. Oh, completely. If I had said, hey, I need something, she would either have ridiculed me or punished me or told me why I was wrong and not gotten it. Mm-hmm. So I had to learn that, you know, how to ask for what I needed, really, and be able to accept it. So I married someone who's very self-focused so I could learn to ask for what I need and accept it. So... Um, so I think that was part of why we connected was because I, re- he was familiar in some ways. It's very mm-hmm. familiar to marry someone who's self-centered when, or self, he's not self-centered. He's just self-focused. Self-focused. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I so married, I think I, I think I married my mom a little bit. Yeah. Uh, he's a combination of both my parents, but yeah. I recognized him. And I mean, many times in therapy, I've been in therapy going, what have I done? I mean, yeah. this guy is a handful. He is a <laughs> handful like what we were talking about earlier where I have to constantly hold on to my stuff so that he can have his stuff and then a day or so later I can go can we revisit that conversation now that we're all calm and then I can get my stuff right yeah so I was like I have had many conversations going why did I do this I mean why and she said (laughs) it's because he was familiar and because you needed to heal that parts of of your childhood so all right well let's talk about let's talk about parenting uh, yeah. a little bit because that's the show it's not Mental being healthy. a spouse is <laughs> being a spouse is as poor as important as when we talk about parenting because um you know it's it's a team effort and you're yeah. only as strong as the weakest link with when you're parenting but yes. um when you uh when your kids went on down a quarantine how have you dealt with um homeschooling and uh video classes and all that stuff is it are, do they have videos well, just like we were talking about before, Georgia is completely self-sufficient. She's just totally gets herself up, gets herself online. Everything's done, and she's at a private school. Everything's done in her school's portal. She's totally got it. Isla. <laughs> and how old are they? Isla's 13, and Georgia's 15. Okay. Isla is a bit more of a struggle. First of all, her portal is kind of a disaster. Like every teacher is doing something differently every day. Mm. And it's hard for me to keep up with. I mean, I made a spreadsheet just to try to keep up with who uses what modality to learn. Right, it's been a little right. crazy. But um, I'm, I'm, here's my perspective. I feel like this is an amazing opportunity to go through something with Isla that I would never have the opportunity to go through. The good, the bad, and the ugly. It is super frustrating to say, hey, we're going to start at 10 and have her be like pulling teeth to get out of bed and we don't start till 1130 because mm-hmm. I can't get my teenager out of bed. Right. That's really frustrating. But at the same time, I'm trying to look at it like an opportunity. Um, to Yeah, we had that issue with, with JoJo, who is like Isla and has been getting out of bed at noon every day and there's nothing we can do about it. Mm-hmm. And so last week she wanted to get together with a couple friends, social distancing and skateboard with them. And our instinct was to say no. And I said, you know what, Jojo, I can see you're getting stir crazy. You're a social being. So we're going to give you this treat. But in return, you're going to feed on the ground out of bed at 1030 every day doing your work. And she was so dying to get outside and see her friends. She was like, Absolutely. So today was the first day of it. She set her alarm. She was she was on the floor at 1030. We'll see if it lasts. But I think it's a lot of parenting they talk about is not punishing, 
but giving rewards for good behavior. And I find it really works. It is effective with her. Punishment for Isla means a zero. Yeah. It has no deterrent for her at all to not repeat some behavior. But rewards have always been the way for her. We did actually something really similar. She wanted to have a virtual sleepover, <laughs> which I find really stupid but because you're asleep. Yeah. So but yeah. she <laughs> FaceTimes her two friends and they fall asleep like this with <laughs> FaceTime on. I'm like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But oh, that's, that's what so she cute. wanted. So yeah. Bert did the same thing. He was like, you can have the virtual sleepover, but you got to get out of bed. And it worked for a week. Yeah. And then now we're in a whole new week. And need a new treat. Need, need a, new, a treat. new treat. I got to have some yeah. other parachute. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, all right. Well, right. Allison, you want to segue into some news? Yeah, let's do some news. Time for the news. Okay, so I have a story from the New York Times, uh, and it is about dealing with siblings who are fighting. And this in particular spoke to me because I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and Mm. I cannot get it through my three-year-old's head that he can't, like, push Owen. So Owen will come up and and try to take a toy or something because he's one, and then Elliot will push him, or or he's just too rough with him. And I know that at that age, they have no impulse control, but it's just sort of a constant source of stress. So um, this writer, Emily J. Sullivan, who has five-year-old twins, consulted a bouncer, a therapist, and a referee, and a cop. Uh, (laughs) That's brilliant. (laughs) Yeah, for advice. Um, And I know that, you know, you guys each have two kids, and I'm sure that this comes up for you too. Um, So I'm curious how you deal with it. But anyway, uh, she first went to a bar bouncer, Um, And what he said is the trick is using minimum force and maximum effort. And he talks about looking at other doormen. And most of what they do is they just menace. By the way, he's British. So that has special British meaning, I think. Um, But basically, you just give them like a super dirty look and make them know that like they cannot continue. Um, so that's one trick. And I feel like with Elliot, I actually, I said no. And then I gave him a really like fierce look one day and he did, I couldn't maintain it, but for a moment it seemed to work. (laughs) No, I Um, find that like, you know, with kids, it's an arms race. And if it starts out with a dirty look and then you escalate it to raising your voice and then you escalate it to yelling and God knows where it goes from there, you're out of control. But if you can keep it, you really can. If you keep it consistent and it's a look or one word or something, you know, keep it right there. Don't jack it up. Yeah, so much is just energy. I have really been trying to work on staying calm. Like even today I was brushing our dog, Wendy, and she doesn't like to be brushed and she resists and then I become anxious, but I just like stayed calm and did a full dog whisper thing and it made it better. But back to kids. Okay, so then she talked to uh, a retired referee in chief for the USA Hockey Pacific District. Um, And he said, before you skate in to break in a fight, you look them over. If it's a lopsided fight, you break them up. But if it's a willing fight, you let them fight. Keep watch, but don't jump into the fray until one of them grabs hold of the other. You don't get into the fight. That's the fastest way to get knocked out. So then um, the writer overheard her two kids. And now they're an even match because they're both five having an argument. And she, instead of jumping in, she just stayed outside and listened and they did resolve it on their own. Um, I have been thinking about, because Daniel said something, because I've been very stressed over like, what do we do about the two of them being physical with each other? And Daniel was like, you know, they probably will work it out on their own. So I've been trying to hold off a little more. Um, Do your your girls ever get into it? When they were little? Oh, Yeah. yeah. Well, and now, right? Now, actually, quarantine has been like bliss. I don't know what happened, but they all of a sudden went, oh, I could play Scrabble with you, too. Yeah. I don't know. I, they've, they've been awesome. But when they were little, yeah, Isla, like I said, was a hitter. Yeah. And, you know, I this is pretty bad, but, you know, I, I lived for a little bit of time with my grandparents who had a big farm. <laughs> so I kind of treated them like, um, like how you train dogs, where it's all about posturing mm-hmm. and who's the alpha, right? So when they were little, I would just alpha everybody. 
if there was if anybody got hurt but i would let them fight too especially what's hard about boys too is i think boys are more physical than girls i had two girls Mm -hmm. and i think some of that is okay to work out physically um if they're not you know bashing each other over the head with a you know metal truck or something but it is about watching and for me it was all about physical posturing Mm -hmm. and my voice just like when you train a dog that's interesting yeah. right right <laughs> the tone I, of voice is all the dog knows and well, this preschool that my kids went to was uh it was the reggio technique which is this mm-hmm. italian inspired technique when and one of the biggest things is letting kids work it out it's all about yeah. you know and i don't think at the preschool they let them hit each other but you know by extension just like you know if they can't people figure shit out I mean, I watch fights online all day. It's like my kind of like fetish. (laughs) And fights end. Fights end. They don't go on forever. And if it ends by themselves, they learn a lesson. And if you break it up, all you're doing is keeping them from figuring out conclusions. I agree. I mean, when my kids were like one and three, Isla was um, fast to take things and throw Mm. and hit. And I, I just kept everything really simple. No throwing. No hitting. That's Georgia's. That's yours. Yeah, right. And did and that, that makes did that work though? Because it took I feel a like, long time. Yeah. But it did. You know, my mother in law is like an early childhood growth and development expert. And she would always say, Some kids get it faster than the others, but it's repetition and using the same words over and over and over again. We don't hit. No hitting. No hit. No hit. Okay. And then they get it. But it, you know, it took Isla forever to get anything like right. that. But, we really need whistles. <laughs> right? Well, that is how you train a dog where in the, on a farm is with a whistle, so yeah. maybe. <laughs> right. uh, and then she talked to a cop um, who I feel like had very cop-like advice, which was have one stay in the house and one step outside. Get them as far away from each other and out of each other's eyesight. And so then the writer says that this only works if you have backup. So when they started fighting, she called for her husband to come in, and then he took one of them and took her on a walk. And then by the time they got back, everything had blown over. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, Leanne, I did want to ask you, speaking of animals and farms, you guys have chickens, right? Yes. I love my chickens. I personally am curious about that because I wanted to have chickens. And then also our show has like a chicken sex fetish, which I know sounds weird. <laughs> what? But Greg and I have been, we've had a lot of questions about how chicken reproduction works and like how many times do they have to have sex for how many fertilized eggs. And then I know that you might not know the answer and that's okay. But a lot of our callers have called in or we've received a lot of calls from people letting us know and people have let us know like they're very into the chicken content. So we're a chicken Fine. podcast that discuss parenting content sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your chicken experience like? I freaking love my chickens. You know, living on the farm, we had a hen house, you know, for eggs uh, full of layers and um, had no relationship with those animals. You just walked in and took it. I was scared of half of them because a lot of them were really aggressive. But that has not been my experience with my own chickens. We got them when they were two days old. Or two days old, I think they were this oh, big. They were oh, tiny. little chicks. They were so cute. And um, they've just been great. They're really easy. I feed them. I feel. I fill their feeder like every three days. Their water every three days. I muck out their stuff once a week maybe. We get probably five eggs a week per chicken. And they are seriously the lowest maintenance animals in this house. Humans included. Um, <laughs> they... They are incredible animals. They're really smart. So I've trained them to do a couple things. Oh, like what? And, uh, like when I, I, I use this one call and they know they're getting uh, food and that's how I get them in their coop. So uh, they know to just go inside their coop. Um, that's one of Can them. Can you cuddle and a chicken? You can if you start, if you are very hands-on from very little and do it every day then they understand, oh, okay. They actually, from what I understand, they bond to one person, usually. Mm -hmm. So they're all really bonded to me because I'm the main caretaker. But Isla and Georgia both can just go pick them up and do whatever they want. Chickens kind of let you know you're the boss by like squatting down and putting their wings like this and bite behind them. Mm -hmm. So they're (laughs) they're kind of opening themselves up to say, you know, you can pick me up now. And... um, they do that every time we go in the coop. 
they let us pick them up and they one of them will sit on my lap like while I read before we got this new puppy I would let them free range a lot and they would come in the kitchen and talk to me while I was cooking which was really cool and yes they pooped in the floor Mm -hmm. but yes I had Clorox wipes and I would wipe it up right then and it was not (laughs) a big deal did Um, you cook chicken in front of them (laughs) of course (laughs) of course (laughs) they're birds of i mean you're you're supposed to eat them that's what they're here for right that's my opinion they were put here to be eaten so you get any complaints from the neighbors about noise no no complaints they have a pretty regular schedule they seem to they only really make a lot of noise when they're about to lay an egg Uh and i obviously i don't have a rooster um so they they usually lay an egg between like 9 30 10 30 in the morning so by that time, everybody's already up and going. They're so not, no podcasting going. in the mornings in your house? Uh, well, uh, sometimes you can hear them yeah. uh, on my podcast, yes. Uh-huh. Um, can we hear one. this special chicken call, please? Sure. You ready? Yeah. Ladies! Ladies! That's it. <laughs> and they go, choo, 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 choo. They're two feet. Run like crazy. They're the cutest things when I call. I love Ladies. it. Ladies! And no problems with the dogs and the chickens, or do you keep them separate? Well, you know what? We just got a puppy, and the puppy does not get it. But she is like, pray? I'm on it. I will get those chickens. <laughs> but before yeah. that, when I had them when they were little, we have a you know 135-pound bull mastiff, and I have a 13-pound terrier and a 13-pound cat. And I would put each animal in the little area with the chickens while I was again the alpha in control and kind of alpha the situation into no one hurting the chickens and before we got this puppy they would all be in the yard there's pictures on my Instagram of all of them in our front yard together at the same time um, and that was like our regular every day the chickens would get out but this puppy is a completely different beast she is she did not get that privilege of upbringing. So she thinks she's going to eat them. So we haven't let them out with the puppy. So. Got it. Yeah. Should we uh, do some highs and lows? Let's do some highs and lows. Okay. Highs and lows. All right, Leanne, you start. What was your high of the week? My high of the week was I think I finally got Isla up and running on her school stuff without me. Pretty big parenting high. That took, only took five weeks. <laughs> it took forever. But that was a pretty big, pretty big one. Um, I'm really proud of her for that because it took a lot of, um, a lot of organizing herself to get that done. So that's a and good high. What was the... You did it with a reward, right? You were just saying? We did it with a reward, but we I also just kind of did it by saying, this is the way life works. Like mm-hmm. If you have a job, you have to be there on time. And the boss says, you know, you're working at Starbucks, and the boss says, count this, you know, eight stacks of cups, most boring, mindless thing on the planet. You have to do it. So, yeah, school's more fun with all your friends. And, yeah, school's more fun when you can be social. But that's not where we are. And sometimes your boss is going to make you count cups. So you just got to think about it like that is learning a life skill instead of just learning about the Declaration of Independence, you know, right. and history and science and whatever. So I think that clicked a little bit. Good. Oh, wish I'd thought of that five weeks ago, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we learn as we go. <laughs> yeah. I had an amazing Zoom call with uh, 14 of my closest friends from college. Wow. Go be you terriers. And, That's awesome. Awesome. Uh, and we just like, we talked for like an hour and a half. And I mean, they really are, I would say half of them to this day are like my closest friends on the planet. And I'm so used to talking to them individually. And we're always talking about like, oh, we got to have a reunion. You know, maybe we'll all come to LA and it never happens. And um, and first of all, we all showed up on the screen and I was like, whoa, why did everybody's <laughs> parents show up for the Zoom call? <laughs> you know, we look terrible, but um <sighs> But it was fun. And like my friend George and Mallory, they got married. They live in uh, Connecticut and and she's a hedge fund manager and he works on Wall Street. And they have like tens of millions of dollars. So we're shitting on their background. They're, they're cooking. Uh, they're, they're cooking like filet mignon on the grill in front of us. <laughs> it was hilarious. It was fun. That's great. Yeah. Zoom. I mean, you wouldn't think that the Zoom call with that many people would work. 
it totally works. It's amazing. Yeah, I think you can do like up to 300 people or something like that. Oh, really? Yeah, I think so. There's something where you need a pro account. Mm. It may, you may need Maybe. it for that. But, um, Maybe. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting the way as much as we are so separate from one another, we're connecting more. We're, you're connecting with more people than you would in your normal unlockdown life. Mm. I agree. I think it, it's making us value each other differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, to really look at who you value and why. And I know I'm a very, um, I, I say what I feel pretty much all the time. And I've been very sappy with my friends. You know, yeah. I, I really miss you. Yeah. And, you know, I wish I could see you. And, you know, we don't really ever say those things to our friends because we see them all the time. There's no reason to miss them. But that shows them their value to you. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a great opportunity to to say that to somebody. It's true. Yeah. Um, so my I love high, you, Leanne. Oh, I want you I to love be you guys too. I want I you to be you, my Allison. mom. Yeah, I, want I know. To, I think everyone wants Leanne to be their mom. Aww. Yeah, I know. That's uh, sweet. My high. I have. This is speaking of sappy. Um, we've started going around the table and doing a gratitude list uh, at night. We've done it two nights in a row, and this is after Owen goes to bed. Um, and so it's Daniel, Elliot, who's three, and me. And we started with, I got out a special notebook for this and, and I would write down mine and then write down Daniel's. And then, um, I asked Elliot and I didn't really think that he would get it, but he's in his own little way does seem to get it. Like he'll be like, I'm grateful for lemons <laughs> or I'm grateful for dinner. I'm, you know, I'm grateful for my brother. Um, and it's so fucking cute. And then he, so we did, we, we went around um, and did it a couple times and then he wanted to hold the pen and hold the notebook and have us think that this is how he put it. So th th then, so w I would say something and then he would take the pen and he would repeat what I said and just write dots for each syllable. <laughs> and then he would like, when, it, when he was thinking he would chew on the pen, like, like he's like taking down the minutes and I <laughs> neither of us know where he's maybe in, maybe in preschool he's seen people make lists but he has all the affectations that you would have if you're like jotting down notes it is so <laughs> funny and he loves it and he also like he gets it but he also doesn't because like Daniel will say you know I'm th I'm grateful that no one I know is sick and then I'll say that's a good one and then Dan I mean Elliot will write down he'll go that's a good one okay mommy <laughs> your turn and it's just been it's it's just been really special to to watch um, him interact with us in that way. It's so cute. That's so cool. That's and cute. now let's do some lows. We should have done this the reversed way. But anyway, mm -hmm. Leanne, what was your low of the week? My low of the week, Bert was um, right. He was not super nice yesterday, <laughs> but it might have been my fault. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed and uh, – was just on the wrong side of the bed. And sometimes if I wake up on the wrong side of the bed and I can't right my boat, it throws Bert into a tailspin for the whole day. Mm -hmm. And yesterday, my brain went, you know what? It's just going to have to go down. <laughs> I just need to be, I just need to be an asshole for yeah. about an hour. Yeah. And uh, that was pretty much my low, I think, because I knew it would affect him adversely and I just needed to be in a bad mood. Um mm. So that's probably my low. Bad <laughs> moods. It? Bad moods can be really enjoyable. They can be very like uh, emotional. It's like you're churning a lot of stuff up. It's good. Yeah, it is good. You know, I think uh, Bert a lot of the times looks to me for the temperature of the room, so to speak. And so sometimes that's too much pressure for me. Sometimes I want to be at a different temperature than the rest of the room. Mm -hmm. And yesterday was one of those days where I was like, I just need to be at my own temperature. I need to be, you know, I'm used to being by myself a lot. Uh, and I've been with lots of people for a long time. So I think yesterday I just needed to be, I just, I had had enough of, of, of too many people around. So... Yeah, I was not nice yesterday morning, which made him not nice for the entire day. Right. <laughs> I got out of it after about an hour, and then yeah. the rest of the day he was a big poo poo pants. Uh, so. <laughs> did you guys talk about it? Like, is is this made explicit? Sort of what's going on, and you're you're feeding off of me, and et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. 
Oh yeah, as soon as I showed up, he was like, okay, you're in a bad mood and you're about to put me in a bad mood. And then of course I go, in my brain, I go, your bad mood has nothing to do with my bad mood. My <laughs> bad mood is my bad mood. You get your own bad mood. Yeah. Why are you stealing my mood? <laughs> you get off of me. You're always all over me, is what my yeah. brain was doing. And then of yeah. course he sensed me separating and went, oh my God, now I'm in a really bad mood and it's your fault. And I, of course, refused to take responsibility for his emotional state. So... Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty, it was talked about for sure. I'm and, relating to it and it's just, I'm exhausted by proxy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a long day. It was a long day and yeah. I kept going. But you know what I do for some reason is I go, none of this is mine. I had mine, I owned mine, I said mine. Yep, I'm in a bad mood, you're right in a bad mood. So you doing the tantruming that you're doing is really not mine. So I'm not going to take it. You keep doing it, but I'm just ignoring it like a child. Yeah, PayPal your uh, your therapist an extra 50 for this week. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so I'm like, this isn't mine. This is your business. I'm just going to go along with my day now that I've righted my boat. All right, Hopefully. well, my, my low was um, my mom, her best friend died a couple days ago. Oh, oh no. no. Yeah, and they live in the same building in Florida. And this woman was just one of these magic people who just, mm. we would come visit and she'd show up with a big plate of homemade cookies. And she was like, had a great sense of humor, Irish and very like, uh, just, just sweet. One of those people, you know, that's all you have to say sometimes is one of those people. You just, the world is uh, uh, just a less of a place when you lose somebody like that. And my mom, and my mom is so funny. She, she sends my my daughter and my uh, mother are pen pals. They write each other letters, which is in the in the days of email and texting, it's just so sweet to get a letter. Like yeah. you, 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 kids don't get letters, so they she loves it. So she's reading part of the letter to us at the dinner table, uh, like this this past week, and it says it says uh, I'm so happy that you guys all have each other to eat dinner with and play games. There's cold trucks driving dead bodies through Florida. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's just like the Irish in her. She couldn't, she could, she couldn't stay positive that long. <laughs> All she could do. All she could do. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Did her friend, was it COVID related or just? No, no. She had a heart condition for many, many mm. years. And uh, she had been slowing down this past year. And then, uh, yeah, she was in the hospital for a week. They couldn't visit her. Her family couldn't couldn't yeah. visit her in the hospital because it's not just COVID patients. Nobody's allowed to visit anybody there right now. Right. right. So that's a sad way to go. She FaceTimed her family and that was it. Oh, mm. yeah. that's her heart. God. So yeah. awful. I, um, I have a similarly uh, super sad one. Um, Leanne, oftentimes what will happen is I'll have a very like light low and then Greg will be like, oh, well, my someone I know committed suicide and I'm just like damn you damn you but this don't time don't fuck with the Irish on Lowe's we got the low market <laughs> locked down it's not a contest <laughs> however uh, mm. a longtime listener of Allison Rosen is your new best friend she's also a listener of Childish she was at uh, our sketch fest show she was in the audience and participated um, I and I like I've met her a number of times I found out is in the hospital, unresponsive, oh. intubated. Um, I don't know if she's in like a, a medically induced coma. I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly what's going on. Her husband. With COVID? No. Oh. <clears throat> um, well, actually, I don't know. Uh, my understanding is they don't think it's COVID because there were no indications that it was. Um, mm. I haven't heard anything for a couple of days. Her husband found her collapsed like in the middle of the night. And so she was taken to the hospital and I don't know anything else. Another listener, cause they're, they're sort of like this community of listeners. Um, let me know. And I've been checking her Facebook page and like her husband's Facebook page and just sort of waiting for news. Um, it's just hitting me so hard. Hmm. Um, because I, I don't know her super well, but like I said, she sort of was like, anytime I would do a live show, she's there. And I've, I've run, you know, I, I 
had this thing like this streak of running into her at the airport when I was leaving like flying out of town after my shows um and just the idea of something happened to her I just can't I just can't <laughs> mm. so I'm just kind of like braced waiting to find out what's gonna happen yeah. um mm. yeah so uh so yeah that's my low and I don't there's not a, a resolution to it yet because I don't know how she's doing and what's happening right all right so take take that Greg Oh, yeah, yeah. Hopefully. Is this a great segment, Leanne? We uh, say <laughs> we say really depressing shit towards the end of the show. Hey, it's part of life, right? <laughs> yeah, especially right, right now. Especially right now. Um, Greg. Well, did... I think maybe we should let Leanne go. Okay. Because we've okay. had her for a long time, and she's been amazing. <laughs> and I, I, I'm just afraid that she's going to start to suck, and then it'll be like, <laughs> what happened to the amazing Leanne we had? Right. <laughs> it is possible. <laughs> Although, Greg, if that was our measurement, I should have tapped out like half an hour ago. Oh, stop <laughs> That's it. not You're... true. Come on. You had a great not high. True. Leanne, true. thank you so much for joining us. Let people Aww. know. I mean, everyone should go listen to Wife of the Party. Oh, I do need to, before you go, I do need to ask you, because you host Wife of the Party, which yes. I love that title. Where did that come from? Uh, Bert, the title of Bert's book is Life of the Party. And I had been, you know, he's been trying to get me to do a podcast for years and finally, I was like, okay, well, I came up with all these titles that were all taken. I kept, I don't even remember what they were. And I was like, well, that's yeah. taken. And that's taken. And that's taken. So then one day I was, I think I was probably flipping through his book. It's on our coffee table in there. And I was like, what about wife of the party? And he goes, that's it. Yeah. That's it. Wife of the party. So it's such a I am kind of the why I'm the stable in the party at this house. <laughs> so. And when does it come it's, out? It drops every Thursday. It's on YouTube. It's on wherever you listen. Two podcasts. Um, I like it. It's really fun. We chat with my friends about all kinds of things. Parenting being mm. one of them. Marriage. It's a really good podcast. I was listening to the Thank Rules you. of Engagement episode and I, I learned some things. Thank you. That's my intention. If I can learn, I feel like if I can learn something every episode, then everybody else can learn too. And I am such a student of life that I look forward to learning. And sometimes the learning is that you have a really great friend and you're having fun with them on the podcast. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be deep learning, just something right. that enriches you. So thanks for having me on, guys. It was really right. fun. Greg, where can everyone, uh, is there anything you want to plug? Uh, I want to uh, plug my other podcast. It's called, well, I have two others. One is called The Sunday Papers, which just launched last month. And we're all up, all up the charts ass. <laughs> and it's got its own, uh, it started out on my Fitz Dog Radio podcast, but has, like Dr. Phil left Oprah, it now has its own podcast feed. You guys can so hear me, uh, you have I'm, to go to iTunes and, and look up Sunday frozen. Papers, uh, subscribe, like it, do all that stuff, keep us going. And then Fitz Dog Radio is the other podcast, as you all know. Nice. And listen to my podcast. Allison Rosen is your new best friend. Comes out twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. It's like two podcasts in one in that Monday is a one-on-one -on -one and Thursday is a group show. Uh, and it is super fun. And also I'm on Patreon and I'm on Cameo. And um, we love you guys so much. Please keep the interaction coming. Keep those nice comments coming. It helps out the show. All of that. Um, Leanne, thank you so much. Thank you. It was really fun. You guys oh. are such nice, great people. Thank you. Oh, that's Hi. nice to hear. <laughs> Always nice to have a good chat. Okay, thanks. Look forward to getting together with you guys soon. Yes. Nope, Greg, that's not how we end the show. <laughs> okay, I'm, you, you, I'm you Greg know, Fitzsimmons. I'm Allison Rosen, and, and we, we are, are Childish. childish.